very least, inspire some additional work in this area. There's many, many questions, not as many answers, but I suppose that's what scholarship is all about. Thank you. I'd like to ask uh, Joe Fishman of Vanderbilt University to present on Neil Netanel's From Maimonides to Microsoft, the Jewish Law of Copyright. Since the birth of print. Okay, so um, a couple weeks ago I was uh, lucky enough to be in the Ramaz uh, synagogue in Krakow. And the entire time that I was there, all I could think about was copyright law, of all things. Uh, and I have this book uh, to thank for it. So uh, those of you that were here last night um, uh, heard Neil's presentation, if you already know, the book covers uh, a lot of ground. Uh, it's tracing the development of the uh, Jewish law. You can call it copyright if you want, but basically the law that regulated the rights of publishers and later on uh, authors to control the reprinting of texts uh, from the first rabbinic reprinting ban in Rome in 1518 <laughs> up until uh, Microsoft's uh, 1998 petition uh, to uh, the Beit Din and B'nai Brak uh, concerning software piracy. Um, since uh, we've already had uh, a far better um, and more thorough uh, presentation of, of the basic ground uh, that the book covers than I'm going to be able to provide here, I think I'd just like to uh, move right into noting uh, three short issues or themes um, that the material in this book uh, raised for me, probably three among many others that uh, uh, one might be able to mention. So first, uh, Neil already alluded to at the very end of his presentation yesterday, um, that there is this uh, lingering uh, anxiety or apprehension over um, how much the content of secular law ought to influence the content of halakha. This actually dovetails with the Dina de Makutadina um, discussion from, uh, uh, the, the, from, from Jay's book. Um, so starting with uh, Rabbi Joseph Nathanson and uh, Shuel Meshiv, who implicitly um, silently seems to import uh, the uh, Austrian, contemporary Austrian law of copyright into Jewish law. Um, today, that source uh, has become something of a touchstone for the proposition that um, traditional halakhic precepts um, can uh, afford a perpetual uh, literary property right to authors. Uh, the thing is that that proposition doesn't really seem to resemble much of the uh, uh, rabbinic literature that preceded it. What it does seem to resemble, at least at some level of generality, is um, uh, the Austrian copyright law that existed at the time. Um, and so we see similar anxiety from modern post scheme, uh, whose intuition is that uh, halakha maybe ought to provide um, some similar scope of coverage um, uh, protecting uh, uh, authors, and then struggling with whether uh, it actually does or not. Uh, okay, number two. Uh, uh, it's striking, I think, in, in going through the history here, um, just how much uh, the Jewish experience, the Jewish legal experience with copyright anticipates uh, and is relevant towards uh, later debates, uh, very hotly contested debates that come up under secular law. Uh, so the book uh, uh, rightly, I think, places a great deal of uh, attention on the distinction between whether we are going to conceptualize uh, copyright as a core property right, or rather as some other species of business tort. Um, uh, uh, but there are a lot of other uh, themes running through here, and I don't want them to get short shrift, so let me just uh, mention a couple. Um, we can see a precursor um, in this narrative to what I think today we might call the access to knowledge movement, the A2K movement. Uh, so it's this uh, idea that uh, society, or in this case the Jewish community, has a fundamental interest in the widest possible sharing of uh, whatever we are going to be deemed, or whatever we are going to deem worthy knowledge and learning. Um, so here's 
a, a quote, a famous quote from Justice Brandeis of the, of the U.S. Supreme Court uh, from a case in 1918. The general rule of law is that the noblest of human productions, knowledge, truths ascertained, conceptions, and ideas become, after voluntary communication to others, free as the air to common use. Now here's the Beit Yitzchak uh, in 1899, uh, uh, in a, a tshuva that is taking a relatively uh, permissive attitude towards uh, reprinting and copying. For the Torah is compared to water, from which one may draw freely uh, with no charge. Um, so uh, uh, there's some, some similarity there. Um, and you can go even back even further than the Beit Yitzhak, because, uh, he, though he doesn't uh, uh, provide a, a citation, um, I'm uh, uh, fairly certain that the, the, the uh, uh, source for, for that allusion to water, um, the statement that occurs in several places um, uh, uh, in various Midrashim, Maha mayim chinam leolam kach divrei Torah chinam leolam. Um, so both in substance and even in rhetoric, one the allusion to um, uh, water another to, uh, to air, uh, the impulse is the same, that uh, a, a, a sharing of knowledge should be promoted wherever humanly possible. And so we have some modern post scheme um, in the copyright context that a certain public interest exception um, to uh, what might otherwise be the normal contours uh, of uh, copyright law when we're talking about um, Chidush Torah. Um, or another maybe uh, a less um, uh, predictable commonality um, is the economic impact of standardization, um, uh, network effects. Uh, so uh, uh, Rabbi Mordechai Bennett uh, in 1822, also uh, the tshuva taking a relatively permissive approach um, towards copying, and dealing with uh, the Rodelheim Moxer, uh, which apparently had become at that point the go-to, the must-have uh, edition uh, of the Moxer. And he reasons that uh, because it is the must-have uh, uh, book of the day, one cannot even tell other printers to focus their energy on other publications. It has to be this one. Uh, to me, this seems like a precursor to what US copyright lawyers today would call the merger doctrine. Um, which really only comes up in the second half of the 20th century, um, you know, 200 years later, um, or more, which effectively withholds copyright protection where there is a very limited number of ways um, of expressing something. Uh, and that uh, turns out to be hugely important uh, in the software context, as then there was a recent dispute between Oracle and Google uh, over whether developers' near universal adoption of um, particular strings of declaring <laughs> code. I don't have time to get into what uh, that is, but if you think at, at the level of analogy, uh, if you hit a particular command on your keyboard uh, and uh, uh, if something prints, uh, you don't need to know how it works. You just need to know you hit the command and a particular action will happen. That's more or less what we're talking about. Um, uh, so the question was, is the near universal adoption of that code uh, uh, a reason that, to make that code less appropriate for copyright exclusivity? Uh, and it's the same concern with Moxor layout um, in 1822 that we are now seeing play out in the context of software development. Um, so uh, some commonalities in unexpected places. OK, finally, number three, um, and this ties back to uh, Neil's closing uh, <coughs> comments yesterday that, um, so secular copyright law has its own uncertainties, uh, and so perhaps halachic decision makers don't need to feel sheepish um, about diverging from it, um, if there's a good reason to diverge. And, and with that, I agree. <laughs> but I wonder, though, uh, is uh, to the extent that uh, we, that, that, that post scheme are conceptualizing this body of law as a, 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 a form of wrongful competition. Uh, and so are making rulings based on a perceived or a predicted economic outcome. Um, what are the tools that are available and what are the tools that are actually being used 
um, to make uh, uh, assessments of what those outcomes are on the ground. Um, and uh, I could give a few examples here. I think I only have time for one. So uh, uh, the contemporary uh, examples of Rabbi Asher Weiss takes uh, the position that um, music recordings that are available on the internet uh, are implicitly licensed uh, for free reproduction uh, because if uh, the authors or composers uh, were to insist on preventing copying, then consumers would just turn to some alternative that has fewer protections placed on it. Um, so any uh, attempt to, to, to uh, protect the material would be, uh, would be futile. Well, maybe. Uh, or maybe not at all. It, 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 it depends on how much of an economic substitute one recording is for the other. And maybe for some listeners, it's Beyonce or bust. Uh, and I don't think that we're talking about Beyonce here, but the same, the same principle applies. Uh, you would want to know something about what is the cross elasticity of demand? How imperfect are, are, are these substitutes for each other? Um, uh, so, if uh, uh, the, the system here is meant to make predictions um, or, or, or hypotheses about what the economic effects of particular rules are going to be, I, I think a, a, a logical follow-up to the, um, the substantive material that's presented in the book is maybe procedural or evidentiary, which is asking <coughs> how are the relevant decision makers here arriving at their their conclusions. So, um, so to sum up, uh, apropos of uh, Justice Hendel's comments last night, I think for comparative scholars, uh, uh, this uh, uh, the Jewish law of, uh, of copyright uh, is a, a really tremendously uh, rich source of uh, different approaches to to, to modern debates. Um, as long as the halakha is purporting uh, to uh, make economic uh, really empirical uh, 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 predictions, however, then uh, I, I think it's, it's worth um, spending some time thinking about what, what tools are going to be brought to bear on that project. 